people without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, get set for a mind blowing session as we invite for our first talk today. Now, listen, our speaker is a multi dimensional and widely celebrated industry leader with multiple years of consistent pioneering of innovation in the industry. This is someone who has traversed the length and breadth of architecture and he is here to give us the best from him, from his wealth of knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a resounding ovation. Please make welcome the founder of Total Constant Limited, Architect Theon Lawson. A round of applause for him, please. Don't stop laughing. He is a legend. He is a icon. my total disappointment because I came here and I saw my name, after my name I saw what well, I thought was 15 million. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my friend has, I have only 15 minutes. Um, I look around the room and I see a lot of um, what we call millennials. I don't understand you people. Um, I come from a, what you call analog age. Um, in my office, I've employed or I've worked with quite a few of the millennials. And you set tasks task for them. You come back two, three hours later, they have headphones on, they're watching movies on the, on, on the screen. What about the project? Oh, it's, it's raining. They've somehow been able to multitask in such a way that I really don't understand. We work with drawing boards and stuff when we're in school. And at best, right now, I know how to use color though. And color though, obviously, I so I don't use 3D or anything. So I work with young people to do my renders. I have 15 minutes to talk. So I'll first of all, talk a bit about myself, my past, who I am. Um, I grew up with a talent of art, I can draw. And naturally, I went to become an art. I went to become an artist. I thought maybe there was a career in advertising or something. Until my eldest brother said he was not going to sponsor me all my life. I better get serious and take on a serious profession like architecture. And luckily, I knew about the AA in London, purely by the strength of my portfolio, my art portfolio. Uh, after my unsuccessful first year, where I thought because I could draw, that was all it took to be an architect, I didn't listen to this old, stuttering Canadian lecture I had then. I end of the year I had a very big portfolio, but I had not learned anything in architecture. I thought most of the people in school were crazy because you have people come with dead fish and also strings and stones and stuff like that. I was wondering where this was going to in terms of architecture. Where is this leading to the market? This is fresh that I from Nigeria. I studied technical drawing and draw, so I thought that was all it took. Put buildings together, put forms together, and that was all buildings, all architecture was about. But that guy that came with the fish, fish bones, probably ended up being Calatrava today. So, my second year, or my first year, second time around, I decided to go crazy like everybody else. Um, so I dug deep into myself and tried to find my own crazy. And I relied on folklore, African folklore, because you're studying architecture in the school, of, the school in England, far away from any reference points you can use for yourself. So I relied on my own history, so I can push my own references. African belief says this, hence my approach to my design is this. I use Fela as a major um, advocate for African success or African uh, excellence. Fela's music was being recognized gradually, was on the ground at the time, but anywhere I listened to Fela's music at the time, 
so that there was brilliance in it. So I survived architecture in London, or I survived architecture in London, uh, because it was, was, was the craziest years of my life. I came back feeling I could do anything. Came back, yes, I mean, because I'm trained, I can really do anything. But I did not like Lagos. I thought Lagos was too congested, too much hustle. It was just too wild for me, so I moved to Joss. And I thought Joss could be the alternative capital of Nigeria because Abuja was already corrupt. I mean, they had all these people building big buildings at three times the cost. So let's move to Joss. Let's get all the young guys come to Joss so we can all create this new idealistic society. After five years, I'm poverty stricken. I moved back to Lagos. <laughs> Um, so, came back to Lagos and partnered with a couple of friends to form Total Com. We employed about 50, 60 people. Turnover at the time. <laughs> I don't achieve something. Freedom Park happened. Okay, let's, no, let, let me go back a few years. Um, 1999, group of architects got together under the ages, the CIA. I um, mean, about 20 firms, the FMAs, the design groups, um, you name it, all the key firms in Lagos. And somehow I was included in that group. And we got together and said, look, next year's a millennium, what do we do for, as a millennium pr project for, for Lagos? And all the firms got together, invited students from universities, from the University of Lagos, Yaba Tech, and um, went about trying to develop projects for, for, for Lagos, for the millennium. I wanted to create a park. I felt Lagos needed a breathing space, and the park was the only place, I mean, the, the old prison was the only space available at the time. So the idea of Freedom Park evolved. We put all our ideas together in a booklet and submitted to government at the time, and nothing came out of it until 10 years later when I happened to in passing, you mentioned the idea of Freedom Park to somebody who had happened to be a special advisor to Fashola at the time. And she said, oh, that sounds like a great, great idea. Let me run it by Fashola. I mean, let me, let me send this syn um, synopsis to Fashola. And two weeks later, I was meeting with Fashola and presented this idea. And then, then he asked me, how soon can you meet with the executive council? A month later, I was presenting to executive council and the project was approved. So um, learning, ex um, the, the learning from that is that every idea has its time. So give it time. So um, where am I? Um, I'll just run you through a few projects that, um, after Freedom Park, my state sets, my interest in state sets are like waned because um, I, we developed a passion for architecture. I wanted to get back into architecture, and besides I was getting old and my knees were no longer strong enough to climb ladders and stay up all night and everything, so I decided to go back and look at my, my passion. And after Freedom Park, lots of openings tended to, lots of things tended to open. This is a project we did in Abia State for a client of mine. Um, it's, it's, in, it's, a, it's at the, Abia State University, it's called the Olga Family Hall. It's an auditorium for the business faculty. And it's just something I was playing with in terms of forms and colors. Okay, this is um, Freedom Park. The top left picture shows the park as we, or the, 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 the old prison site after it had been abandoned for 30 years. Uh, the buildings had been pulled down in the 70s. Freedom Park uh, was originally Broad Street Prisons. It was built in 1872 and was pulled down in 1972. So it was existed for all of 100 years. So you can imagine the history that's imbued there. And so the challenge we had was how to tell the story without, how to create a park and tell the story of a prison without rebuilding the prison. So you can see this um, from the, from the um, abandoned site and all the bushes to when we cleared the site to eventually developing the project site. 
It became an oasis in the middle of Lagos, concrete, the concrete jungle in Lagos. And that's the, the old walls that were retained and part of our new construction. Now this is um, the Kalakuta Museum. This is Fela's old house. This is um, on Bimsala Street. Fela had died, um, I think at the time, about all of 15, this, about 12 years. And the building had been essentially left to dilapidate. It still had some members of the family and a lot of hangers on. So the idea was I proposed to the family the conversion of the building to a museum. I sent a proposal to the Lagos State Government, asked if they would uh, support just by endorsing the project. And again, um, Fashola not only endorsed the project, but also gave the initial grant to convert it. So it became the Kalakuta Museum. And um, uh, incidentally, when Fela died in 1997, I approached the family because of my um, interest in my love for Fela and offered my services to build his tomb. And um, I sent in drawings and proposal, and that was, it was approved. So in 1970, 1997, I built his tomb, and many years, 15 years later, I was building his museum. So there's some connection. I mean, right from school. So this is part of the interior of the Kalakuta Museum. Um, following Freedom Park, we were invited by several state governments to look at projects of their own, projects for them. This was in Ocean State. It's supposed to be a cultural center in Ocean State. Um, we had done, submitted designs and they liked it and only for them to realize they didn't have money to move <laughs> further. So. It was a cultural center where you had lots of, I mean, they had the Oshun, Oshubo Festival. It was supposed to be a place where you could have masquerades and different um, uh, festivals. Now, um, I was also invited to look at the University of Lagos Anniversary Park, 50th Anniversary Park, the waterfront site. Uh, we had all these this great ideas um, of create, telling a story of um, where students and the academia meet and how the, the tower of knowledge, and lots of little things there, lo lovely little ideas. But again, we went as far as building the memorial wall and a temporary 50-column um, um, structure, 50-column um, monument which represented 50 years of the university. But that was temporary because we were still looking for funds to complete the project. Uh, it's been, I think, three, four years. Uh, nothing has happened since then. Now this is, um, this is called the Chimedie Museum. It's, um, it's for the Obi of Onicha. He's a major art collector and uh, we've, we met with over over drinks one time and we got talking about his project. And his, his house is like a, a warehouse of artwork. Corridors, toilets and stuff are stacked with paintings. And eventually this was supposed to be the repository for those paintings, so, or those works. Unfortunately, I don't have, um, I mean it's not big enough for you to see clearly. But work has started on site and um, we hope in the next year or so it should be completed. So that's where I am. And next thing is to say, what are my learning experiences or what can I impart? What messages, what message do I have for you guys? My lessons learned. First thing is to know yourself and what you stand for. As much as you can, be honest, especially to yourself. Never take yourself too seriously. There are more important issues than yours. Share your ideas to validate your truths. Every idea has its time. You may just be its messenger. Think of providing a solution to a problem and not imposing a vision. Hard times will come, 
and they will go. Understand the difference between style and fashion. Understand the difference between want and need. Care about your client and not your ego. Address your needs and maybe address his needs and maybe his wants will yield. Understand that there's nothing new. You don't create. At best, you may compose. There's only one creative, our creator. At best, we're all kleptomaniacs or create thieves. Listen to your parents and learn from history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, architect Theo. That was absolutely inspiring. I'd like us to take one or two questions right now. One or two questions for, for architect Theo. If you have any question, please raise up your hand. One or two questions very quickly. Oh, one. I have one here. Thank you. Two. Do you have another person? Two. All right. Thank you very much. Please come forward. Can we please put our hands together for them as they come forward? Yes, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda, and I am an architecture photographer. I have very little experience of architecture, so I try to yeah. be around these things yeah. to get, learn as much as I can. But um, I have a question to ask that is uh, slightly unrelated to what you spoke about, but is merely out of curiosity. And what I wanted to know is this. You've done a lot of restorative work with uh, Freedom Park and also with um, Calicutta Museum. Are there any organizations here that actually support restoring? And not in the sense of just working on monumental works like uh, the house and the museum, but then more like what regular people have to educate them about their living situations and how they can make their houses better. Because for example now, very soon, I will be moving out of where I stay to stay in a, an entirely different place. And a problem that I notice is that most of the houses here have issues. Nobody pays attention to renovations or trying to make them better. So don't you think that it's a responsibility of those who know to educate those who don't and then teach them better ways to manage their houses and actually build them a lot better than they are today? Is, that, is there anything being done about it? Is there anyone interested in it? Is there, are there any steps that can be taken towards that direction? Thank you. Well, I'd say just talk to an architect. Sorry? Just talk to an architect. All architects are trained to deal with problems. So you create, you, you have a challenge. The architect's responsibility is to deal with your specific challenge. There's no, there are no limits to, uh, no, no boundaries. It doesn't have to be all new, new, new construct. So the architect is trained or should be trained to deal with any uh, problems like that. I believe the NIA, the NIA and um, ANAN and all the other um, bodies, not the state government. Um, so the NIA is the best uh, organ to educate us. Um, I, know, I know there's the legacy. Legacy are specific to um, heritage, buildings of heritage. But um, I think the NIA ultimately has the, that responsibility. Thank you very much. All right, the second person, please. Can you ask your question very briefly? Thank yes. you. Yes, um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. My question, you talked about getting to know yourself. So um, do you have any, any pointers, anything that will make that journey slightly easier? Because um, I did my first degree in the UK, in England, and I'm doing my master's here in Covenant University. So sometimes I find myself being dragged in opposite directions and it's really difficult to find the real me and come into it. So do you have any pointers or anything at all? Uh, basically, it's a personal journey. It's always a personal journey. And um, like I said, I found my comfort zone relating to folklore, or African history, or Fela's music, something that I could connect to that um, justified whatever I was doing at the time. It made it easy to rationalize, especially in school. 
I'm doing this because of this. I love Eli's music, so um, there's a certain thing about his rhythms or his message that I, I somehow find a way of interpreting into my work. Um, I love history, so um, I, I research things, I, I look at the past. So I think you'll find something that, you, that resonates with you, that makes you feel comfortable uh, in justifying what you do. I mean, you can never justify a lie. So as long as, you, as long as you're not comfortable saying what, uh, putting forward something, it's not true, you're not true to yourself. You will find that peace ultimately in communicating to a client or to your parents or to whatever, what you believe in. And once, once you find that, hold on to it and build your life around it or build your work around it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.